what you don't know can hurt you. And the fear of not knowing about Alzheimer's, its warning signs, what are not warning signs, all of that can create more anxiety. So my discussion today with Kimberly Best, the Senior Director of Development for the Alzheimer's Association of South Carolina, helped to answer some of those questions, those things we don't know. We talked about the warning signs, what they are and what they aren't. We talked about some of the benefits of early diagnosis. And I learned that lifestyle behaviors, changes in our lifestyle behaviors can prevent 40% of some dementias. That's pretty amazing. Uh, we talked about some of the resources that you can find on ALZ.org different fundraising events and how they can raise awareness of Alzheimer's and ways for you to get involved. I think you will find this conversation very useful. My name is Wendy Green and I am your host for Hey Boomer. Hello, Hey Boomer listeners. I hope everyone um, appreciated what their fathers, or if they don't have their father with them anymore, thought about their fathers over Father's Day this weekend. Um, I And I think you probably saw my post that I shared about my father. So uh, it's special to have a good relationship with your father. Uh, I first became aware of the impact of dementia on families when my grandmother started showing symptoms. It was the late 1970s. We didn't know much about Alzheimer's or dementia or any of that um, back then. And I remember it being especially difficult on my father because he was very close to his mother and he would get so frustrated when she would forget things or repeat things. And, you know, as she declined more and more, it he just didn't know how to deal with it. And I'm sure looking back now, a lot of that was out of fear, the unknown, you know, what's happening. She's not the mother that he remembered. It was really, really hard and hard to watch him going through that. I was married with children by then. Um, so I wasn't living at home, but every time I visited, I, I experienced that. And then um, in the last 10 or so years, my mother has uh, been leading Alzheimer's support groups where they the caregivers can come and share some of their stories and challenges and learn and feel supported. And the support groups that she runs are sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association. So that's how I became even more aware and have participated in the Walk to End Alzheimer's over the last, I guess, eight years since I've been here in Greenville, South Carolina. But in preparing for this um, interview today or discussion today with our guest, I wanted to do some research about how the Alzheimer's Association came about. And I found that it was individuals, family caregivers that recognized a need for an organization that supported them, that educated them, because like I said, there wasn't a lot of information. We didn't talk about family members that had dementia, um, certainly not early on and even up into the 70s and 80s. So the Alzheimer's Association was founded in 1980, and it was to provide support for Alzheimer's and advanced research into the disease. Jerome Stone, who was the founding president, realized that not only was information missing, but 
he became even more aware of that when his wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 1970. And so Mr. Stone took this disease that was cloaked in mystery and helped to create a global conversation. And it is truly global now. The Alzheimer's Association reaches millions of people affected by Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia all around the world. They are leading voluntary health organizations in Alzheimer's care, research, and support. In addition, June this month <clears throat> is Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month. And yesterday, June 20th, was an event sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association uh, called The Longest Day. And so I'm hoping to learn more about what that was about as we speak with our guest, Kimberly Best. Um, and then we, are, we will all be prepared for the longest day next year when it comes around. Before we get to that, I wanted to say how much fun I had last week being on Your Carolina and talking about Hey Boomer, and the upcoming Boomer Summit. Uh, we, I, along with the panelists, plan to inspire, educate, and call you to action to thrive. Choosing to thrive, to live life to its fullest for as long as we possibly can is what Hey Boomer is about, and it's what the Boomer's Thriving Summit is about. We are less than 10 days out and you will want to register today. Don't wait. Go to heyboomer.biz, sign up to become part of the summit, to learn from these amazing panelists, to have your questions answered, and to receive some fabulous bonus material. And invite your friends and family to join with us. I also want to remind you all to comment, to ask questions. This is an interactive conversation and Kimberly is here to help us understand and raise our awareness about Alzheimer's. And uh, so she will be glad to answer your questions. And if we can't answer any questions today during the broadcast, we will be sure to answer them later on or get you in touch with Kimberly. And with that said, I would like to introduce Kimberly. Hey there. Hi, Wendy. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm very grateful for you to be here. So Kimberly is a South Carolina native and a graduate of Clemson University. She began her career working in sales and training in the pharmaceutical and computer industries. But after 9-11, she chose to enter the nonprofit arena. And since that time, Kimberly has worked for several diverse organizations in her community, dealing with issues ranging from domestic violence to children's health. Kimberly has been with the Alzheimer's Association for 11 years as the Senior Director of Development for the South Carolina chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. She manages staff and volunteers across the state that raise funds needed to support the programs, services, and research efforts of the Alzheimer's Association. Her greatest passion is for raising awareness with Alzheimer's disease and the Alzheimer's Association to help others avoid the struggles her own family has faced in dealing with this disease. Kimberly and her husband, Stuart, live in Simpsonville, South Carolina, and are grandparents of eight with number nine on the way. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to Stuart. Right. Yeah. So Kimberly, is there anything that I left out in that introduction? No, I think you covered it quite well. I'm glad that we got the grandkids in there. Always love the opportunity to talk about them. Oh, I know. Aren't they the best? <laughs> so you mentioned in your bio that your family had some struggles with Alzheimer's. And I wonder if you would give us some background and share what that was like. 
Well, if you were to see a picture of my family tree, you would see that we have Alzheimer's disease coming down every branch of it. I had a great grandmother who lived alone into her late 90s when she was then diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, she ultimately ended up having to move into a care facility to get the care that she needed, and she passed away with the disease. I then had a grandmother, not a blood relative to that great grandmother, but my Mima, my mom's mom, who had Alzheimer's disease, and she actually died from Alzheimer's disease. We saw her progress through every stage of the disease until it ended her life. Mm -hmm. And then most recently, my father passed away last year and he had a diagnosis of mixed dementia and it was Alzheimer's disease with vascular dementia. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, um, if you look at family history, I am probably considered to be high risk of developing it myself. So I tell people that, you know, People always say, oh, you work for a nonprofit. You work for a wonderful cause. I work for my future. I work every day so that my grandchildren will live in a world without Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. That's a fabulous mission to have. Yeah. So that must be a little scary. Like all of us in this age group, um, we forget things. We can't, that word is on the tip of our tongue. All, you know, but when that happens, at least I know, you know, you're like, uh, 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 is this, or, you know, like what's happening? Why can't I get this? And so is that a sign or a symptom of Alzheimer's? It can be. But one of the things I love to talk about when I talk about the warning signs of Alzheimer's disease is also what isn't a warning sign of Alzheimer's disease. So at the Alzheimer's Association, if you visit our website, alz.org, we talk about the 10 warning signs, but under each warning sign, we talk about what isn't a warning sign. So for example, somebody calls me today and says, hey, Kimberly, you were supposed to be on my podcast at one o'clock and you weren't there. <laughs> What's gonna happen for me is I'm gonna go, oh my gosh, you're right, I totally forgot. I have that aha moment. People who have dementia and Alzheimer's disease often do not, don't have that aha moment. They don't have that ability to go back and recall it. So they might say, oh yeah, darn, I just forgot and mask it a little bit. And mm. that, you know, that's one of the things that makes it really difficult with these signs. So we say, looking at these 10 signs, while any one of them could be cause for concern, especially if you start to see an array of the warning signs, you want to make sure that you are consulting a healthcare professional. And I'll tell you, for anyone in your audience, no matter what their age is, you know, if they're starting to get concerned, if they have a family history of these of this disease, you can go into your doctor and ask them for a baseline um, level test of your cognition abilities so that you have something to compare it to on subsequent visits. So they can do a baseline screening and then, you know, whenever you want them to, whenever you're back on a, a subsequent visit and you feel like there may be changes, you can ask them to conduct that screening again. And that can at least help you if you're concerned, you know, have a, di a physician actually say to you, there's cause for concern or there isn't cause for concern. Um, but again, going back to those warning signs, I think it's just as important to know that forgetting where we put our keys, while it's problematic on a daily basis, maybe it isn't an issue unless you get to the point where you can't retrace your steps to find things. That starts to be a warning sign. Okay. And so this doctor that you're talking about to the baseline, that's just your regular family doctor, your internist, your health, whatever, Certainly. your special Right. When we're talking about diagnosis, we really want to go like to your neurologist, you know, to those to those doctors that have real specialty in brain health. However, when we're talking about a simple screening, just, you know, hey, I'm getting into the age of greatest risk because we 65 and older is your age of greatest risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. So once you especially start entering that age or um, if you're concerned about younger onset, you can go to your doctor and ask for a baseline cognition test. So as I think about that, you know, uh, what would be the advantage of me knowing that I might have some early warning signs? That is such a great question. Okay. Well, you know, right now, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And of the top 10 causes, it's the only one that there's currently no way to prevent it 
or to cure it. So people oftentimes ask that question, then why would I even want to know? Well, let me tell you the benefits of knowing. If we can catch Alzheimer's disease in its early stages, then the person with dementia actually gets the opportunity to make decisions about their own care as they progress through the disease. If, the, if Alzheimer's disease is caught late, often that person no longer has the ability to make decisions about their own care and someone else has to make those decisions for them. And quite honestly, if you are putting that burden onto your loved one, you know, wouldn't you rather know yourself to be able to help make those decisions yourself so your loved one doesn't have to make the decisions about how to care for you or what you would or wouldn't want to happen as you're being cared for. So I think that's one great reason. Another great reason is that there's a lot of great research happening right now. So if you are diagnosed with the disease or catch these types of things early, you can certainly take part in clinical trials that are happening mm -hmm. that may be able to be the advancement or treatment that we're a breakthrough treatment that we're ultimately looking for. And most recently there actually was a drug approved for use by the FDA. It is actually an infusion and it's quite costly. It just got approved this month, but it actually has been shown to change some of the physiology of the disease. So it's the first time we've actually had a drug that instead of just helping with the symptoms, actually looks like it's um, attacking some of the things that um, cause Alzheimer's to develop in the brain. So there is exciting research on the horizon that if you get a diagnosis, you can make decisions about engaging in at least stay on top of, you know, you can learn about the disease and what to expect as it progresses, not only for yourself, but for your loved ones who will be around you as you go throughout the disease. And are there things, Kimberly, so say that we go to our doctor, we find out what I would think would be devastating news. Yes, you are starting. Um, are there things that we can do to change our diet or to exercise our brains or things like that, that might slow the progression? Well, there's actually no science about slowing the progression. However, there are studies that show that 40% of all dementia cases could be prevented with lifestyle changes. Really? 40%? 40%, yes. So notice I said dementia because dementia is a big umbrella term. Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's is one specific type of dementia. So those lifestyle changes, while they don't seem to show that they can prevent Alzheimer's, they can prevent other dementias from developing. And those lifestyle changes are things you should be doing anyway. They're the things like eating healthy, like a Mediterranean diet. That's the one we most often recommend for brain health exercising, staying engaged with other people, that helps with your with your brain health, um, learning new things. So, you know, listening to your Hey Boomer podcast or taking part in that virtual summit you have coming up at the end of this <laughs> month, those types of things are really good for your brain health. So we encourage people, don't wait for a diagnosis to start those things. Start doing them now as you age, start developing these healthy lifestyle patterns that could prevent other forms of dementia. The other thing is, I mentioned earlier, my dad got a mixed diagnosis. And, you know, that's really a hard thing because with Alzheimer's disease, one of the benefits of the Alzheimer's Association and um, coming to us when your loved one is diagnosed with the disease is we can educate you about what to expect as the disease progresses because Alzheimer's disease typically has has a typical chain of progression of, of behaviors that you can expect at different stages in the disease. So we can prepare people for those to know what to expect, how to react to it, how to cope with it, you know, provide support. However, when you get a mixed dementia diagnosis like my dad did, of vascular dementia, and then he also had Alzheimer's disease, when we have those combination dementias and issues happening, we often don't know what to expect because is his vascular dementia causing this behavior or is this a result of his Alzheimer's disease? And, you know, with vascular dementia, there's lots of up and downs, whereas with Alzheimer's, it's a progression. Mm -hmm. So it just complicates the diagnosis. So my dad might have been able to prevent himself from developing vascular dementia had he known about and made those interventions. And mm -hmm. then it would have been easier for us to deal with the progression of his Alzheimer's disease. 
Yeah. And that's, that's um, good information. I've had a couple of friends that I've talked to over the last week or so talking about, you know, the program and both of them have said, you know, it's the unknown. Yeah. And, and so talk to me more about some of the programs that the Alzheimer's association offers to help people navigate this unknown progression. And really I, what I love about this, the programs that are offered is that it really spans the spectrum. So we have everything from the program about um, knowing the warning signs, know the 10 signs. We have things about conversations with dementia. So how to have conversations with people like about stopping driving, about what kind of care they're going to need and things of that sort, um, the healthy living for a healthy brain. So maybe you don't think you're at risk, but there are still things that you could be doing because we say at the Alzheimer's Association, if you have a brain, you could be at risk. Uh -huh. So you know, if you have a brain, you might as well start doing the things to maintain your brain health, like even protecting your brain during sports. You know, that's another thing you can do to help prevent mm -hmm. dementia. Um, so our programs are all absolutely free of charge. And our core programs, the ones that I've just mentioned, those core programs are actually available anywhere in the country. We have Alzheimer's Association offices across the country, trained staff and volunteers that can provide these programs free of charge for whatever your situation, group situation is. So if you have um, a a business and you want to have us come in and speak, we can do that free of charge. If you have, let's say, a civic group you're a part of, we can come and speak to that group. Or if you even have a family group, a large family group, and you want us to come and speak to them, we can do that. So those are the programs that we have available. In addition to that, we have support groups. Uh, the support groups are most often for caregivers, but we do have some support groups that are for people in the early stages of the disease when those support situations are are still really powerful and impactful. So we do have support groups for people in the early stages as well. During the pandemic, we were forced to do everything virtually. We just started getting back out there, delivering some of our programs nationwide after August 2nd, I think is the date where uh, we will be back in all of our offices and carrying those programs out in person when wanted and still virtually for those who prefer that. So if you find out or you ex suspect that your parent um, is showing symptoms and you want some education, but you know, I'm not getting it through an office because Hey yeah. Boomer is mine. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there online trainings and resources that I could explore to find out what I should do and that conversation? That would be a big one. Yes. So um, ALZ.org is our website. It's kind of the base hub for all of our information. I mean, that's where you can go to find out about the 10 signs. That's There's actually a community there that you can join um, and be linked up with other people like you who may be concerned about a parent um, developing the disease or may have a loved one with the disease. So there's actually online communities that you can participate oh, okay. in, in addition to all of the um, resources that are there on ALZ.org. So you can go in and look at what are the risk factors. You can look at... Um, like I said, conversations, there's information in there about how to talk to someone when you're having to talk about giving up driving, because that is one of the things, um, one of the warning signs is, you know, the, the uh, decision-making ability starts to wane. And so we really don't want people driving when they have questionable decision-making skills. Yeah. And I think um, like one of my friends was saying, you know, her mother has started showing some um, paranoia, right? And she's, so she's still at home. Um, and they want to start getting her some home health, but mm -hmm. of course she doesn't want anybody in the house that she doesn't know. I mean, that's a conversation because she's still cognizant enough to have that conversation. And one of the things I would say, um, that I've, I've heard in situations like that that's especially helpful is the Alzheimer's Association also offers a 24-7 helpline that people can call um, and they can just talk to a person about their specific situation. What is the specific uh. issue you're dealing with? And then how can you approach that with your loved one or, or how can you approach that? Maybe it's other family members you need to talk to about what's going on. Yeah. So those, those private care consultations are 
just really invaluable. I've heard so many great testimonials about that. And our 24-7 helpline, the way it works is when our staff, um, our local staff is in the office, you call that 1-800 number and it routes you to your local office, to local resources. Now, if you call in the middle of the night where you live, we're probably not in the office. <laughs> right. it's um, staffed by our um, helpline specialists that stay on 24 seven, but those are trained professionals that can talk with you in general about the disease and then connect you back to your local office for any local resources that may be helpful to you. That's and- super helpful. That is super helpful. You know, when when someone says they're concerned about having someone come in and care give, a lot of these companies too, they they have experience dealing with people who don't want them to come in. And they Mm -hmm. are very capable of helping you devise strategies where you can get your loved one the care they need without dishonoring their wishes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the fundraising efforts. Oh, let's. <laughs> I know, because that's some of your fun stuff. <laughs> <That's> my, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about some of them. Okay. Well, in South Carolina, which of course is where you and I are, we participate in three of the Alzheimer's Association um, events. So the first one you mentioned a little bit earlier today is the longest day. It was actually the second signature event of the association. And I like to, scri- to describe it as an un event. So okay. instead of inviting everybody to come to one place, one specific location on a specific day and time, we tell people wherever you are in the world on the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, to do something to help raise funds and awareness for Alzheimer's disease, which can make the days long for the person living with the disease Mm -hmm. and for their caregiver. So that's the symbolism there. And our goal was really to create um, a a rallying cry on that day. You know, our hope would be that one day on the summer solstice, you'll not be able to go anywhere on social media or in your community and not hear about the Alzheimer's Association and the work that we're doing to help people through that long goodbye of Alzheimer's disease. So it's really a great rallying cry. We have people that hike in the Alps on the longest day and then post about it on social media and ask people to donate and follow them. And that's how they raise their awareness. And then all the way to here in South Carolina, in the low country, we have a child who started several years ago and continues to do a lemonade stand on the longest Aww. day. And it's actually was a popsicle stand in honor of her pop. That's what it was. Oh, um, how cute. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it it can be anything. It doesn't matter the age and it doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to get out and do a physical activity. Of course, here in South Carolina in the summer, it was a really (laughs) hot day yesterday. So I'm glad not everybody chose to be outside for their longest day day activities. People play bridge. You know, they do all kinds of things to raise awareness and and bond together on the cause. So it's for awareness, it's, and then you do it on social media, and you ask people to donate as part of that. Okay, exactly. well, that's yes. cool. What yes. else? And then um, the the next type of event that we participate in is a cycling event. Now, nationally, there are one-day rides called um, Ride to End Alls. In South Carolina, we actually do a three-day cycling, three, mm-hmm. three, there, three-day cycling <laughs> event um, called A Ride to Remember, and we start up in um Greenville, South Carolina, actually here in my backyard in Simpsonville. And the, I I say we, (laughs) the cyclists get on bicycles. We support them (laughs) on bicycles. And over the three days, they cycle all the way down to um, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. So into Charleston and across the Ravenel Bridge. Wow. um, All the way down to the Yorktown in, in Mount Pleasant. And they do that again to raise awareness, you know, not only by reaching out to their friends and doing fundraisers to support their activity as they ride and inviting people to support them online, but also as they ride, you know, there are so many people that see this swarm of purple cyclists going um, through some communities across our state. And it really raises great awareness, you know, people trying to figure out what the cyclists are riding for. And um, it, it just is, again, another symbolism for how, hard and agonizing the disease can be. So how many cyclists do you typically get for something like that? Um, I know we have over 300 registered this year, but with, you know, the new environment we live in, probably 150 of those are doing it virtually this year. Um, I'm expecting this year we'll probably have somewhere around 250 actually on bicycles going across the state with us this year. 
And when is that, Kimberly? That's in July. And I do not have my calendar in front of me. I want to say it's like the 7th through the 9th of July. Okay. All it's right. Like Fun. Sunday. Yeah. And then the big event that I love is Walk to End Alzheimer's. Um, it is the signature fundraising event of the Alzheimer's Association. It's actually our single largest funding source. And so, oh. yeah, so it happens in over 600 communities um, across the country, typically between mid-September to the first weekend in November. And we have nine in South Carolina that we do on varying weekends, you know, avoiding football schedules. That's big. <laughs> That's big, um, right. <laughs> but uh, the walk is an event where we call people to come together to um to show how powerful we are when we work together, no matter what our reasons are for supporting this cause, when we all come together, we can really be a powerful force in changing the future of this disease. So it really is a fun and meaningful day. What I love about Walk to End Alzheimer's, it's also a fundraising and awareness event, but it's also absolutely free of charge. So it's a really great opportunity for people who may be wondering about what the Alzheimer's I'm Alzheimer's Association is and what they do to come out and see and touch and feel what it is that the Alzheimer's Association provides to families. So as you know, I have a team. Yes. Yes. So that's um, the link to join my team. So tell me some hints and tips and tricks to uh, grow my team and grow my donations so we can make a big impact. Absolutely. Well, start talking about it just like you're doing today. Put that information out there. Put it out in social media. It's so surprising how many people um, do the majority of their fundraising just through things like Facebook fundraisers. You can actually link your your walk. Once you're registered for the walk, you can link your walk fundraising to Facebook and it creates a fun Facebook fundraiser for you for people to donate. But just like you have this link here for people to register, people can also use that link to go and make donations. So you can share your own personal link with family or friends or colleagues in emails and text messages. We have a Walk to End Alzheimer's app that allows you to text people and uh -huh. it even has the link to tell them about what you're doing to ask them to walk with you and or to support you. The other cool thing about the app is you can actually deposit checks via the app. So if someone wants to support you and they write you a check, you can deposit it via the app. You don't have to mail it in anywhere. It shows up immediately and we get those funds immediately. Nice. So I say that the most the biggest tip I can give people is not to go to just one way of spreading the word and raising funds. The most successful fundraisers are the people who use all of the things I've just mentioned to you. So whether it's the social media tools, the texting, the emailing, one of our biggest fundraisers in um, the walk in Greenville, South Carolina, well, where you and I are, she sends out a letter to all of her current and past clients every year, just telling them that she's participating in the walk and inviting them to either walk with her or donate. And as you said, I've been here 11 going on 12 years now. And every year she's raised over $7,000 oh. with that one technique. All so, right. Well, I got to get that. I got to beat that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been fun for me. You know, it was one of those things where you said one of the um, preventative things is social interaction. And so definitely the walk is a social event, you know, when you get your friends to join you. And um, there's a big celebration here in Greenville. I know when we come back into Floor Field, the baseball stadium, mm -hmm. and everybody has a different color flower. Yes. So what are those different color flowers about? Yeah, I didn't bring my flag. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's my flag. Um, so the, everyone who participates in our walk, so doesn't matter if you donate a penny or not. If you register for walk and you come out and walk with your local walk, you're going to get one of these flowers. And the color is based on your connection to the cause. So if you've lost someone to the disease, you get a purple. If you have the disease, you get a blue. If you're caring for or loving someone living with the disease, you get a yellow. And orange is kind of our catch-all category for people who just support the cause, whatever the reason. But everyone gets a flower. And it's so neat because you get to take that flower with you. But while we're all there together, you can look around and without saying one word. You can see other people that are there for the same reason you are, that are motivated by the same thing that motivates you to be a part of Walk to End Alzheimer's. So it's really emotional and cathartic. I got to say, this will be my first year being at a physical Walk to End Alzheimer's since losing my dad. So wow. I'm now carrying a purple flower. Um, so it, it, 
that yeah. flower is going to have a different meaning for me this year. It's it the same, have. but it's different, you know? Yeah. Uh, so did you um, care for your dad at home? Was he in a memory mm -hmm. care facility? My father, um, my mom cared for my dad at home. They live a few hours away from me. So I was a distance caregiver. We consider those people caregivers too, because there's a lot of love and support that goes into that. Um, so my father, though, ended up having other health complications that required him to go into a skilled nursing facility. Um, they were, they actually cared for him in the general population instead of in the memory care um, unit of that place. Um, they had they had people that cared for him from the memory care area, but um, he was not a good candidate to be in that area with his other medical conditions. So, so what's so true that people people think, oh, well, if they have memory care issues, they're in a memory care facility. So much of your general population at skilled nursing facilities around the country are made up of people who are living with Alzheimer's and other dementia. Yeah. So how did Alzheimer's or did they get involved with, you know, I mean, we had COVID, people were locked out of visiting their relatives. Um, I'm sure when your dad went into skilled nursing care, that was part of it. Did the Alzheimer's Association get involved in any of the um, well, discussion so about that? I can speak on a local level that I know that we had local staff that were on um, a government tap, local state government task force to help address the issues of access to care facilities and to loved ones in those facilities. So our staff, yes, um, and the association in general definitely gets involved in those issues impacting people living with the disease and their caregivers. So not only during the COVID pandemic, but even on a regular basis, you know, advocating for funding that will help with research or help um, with families providing care to their loved one. So I tell people there are basically three ways to get involved with the Alzheimer's Association, and that's to um, advocate, volunteer, and donate. Those are the three basic ways. Um, and I, advocating is such a huge part of what the association does. We have uh, volunteer advocates that speak to our elected officials at every level of government on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So everyone from our local elected officials all the way up to those who serve mm -hmm. at the federal government level, we have regular meetings between them and their offices and our volunteer advocates to make sure that they're aware of the issues that are impacting those living with the disease and their caregivers and basically letting them know our, our stance on those issues. May I add a fourth way to get involved? Yeah. And that would be the people that need to reach out for support. You know, the people that are, are calling that 24 hour hotline that are, getting part of the support group. I mean, that is an, another way to be involved with the Alzheimer's Association. Oh, it certainly is. It certainly is. I mean, and I, I guess in my thought, I was thinking of the ways that you can join with us in providing that to people. But right. yet, that, that is what we live for. That is why we exist, is to provide that support and assistance to families. So, I mean, volunteering like your mom does to lead a support group, that is, she's considered a, a, a volunteer support group facilitator in, in her role. And that is so huge to have people that are willing to share from their own personal stories and experiences and knowledge bases to help guide people through conversations about Alzheimer's disease and, and what they're dealing with and how to deal with it. So if I wanted to be a volunteer, yes. um, are there are there special trainings that I would get from y'all? Yes, we actually, so volunteers, again, you can volunteer in multiple areas. So our primary areas for volunteers are as one, volunteer advocates. So those people especially get trained on the issues that are currently facing those living with the disease, um, making sure that they understand um, how they impact um, um, our constituent base and how to speak with their elected officials about them and the votes that are that come before them. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, support volunteers and program of support volunteers. So that's like your mom. She gets training um, 
uh, about the issues. She also gets training. They also have now started online trainings that news support facilitators get that they go through when they first um, get started with us to give them the basics about the association and the programs and services that we offer, in addition to ongoing training opportunities and communication with the association. Um, and then in the area of fundraising, we probably do the least preparatory training in <laughs> our area. A lot of ours is, I don't want to say trial by fire, but um, <laughs> well, let's call it hands-on training. There you um, go. So, uh, for a lot of our volunteers uh, in the fundraising world what or development um, side of things, what we are looking for is what is your current experience? What are you looking to do? do and then we match you with a volunteer opportunity and then provide you with resources through that. So even with Walk to End Alzheimer's, we depend on a volunteer committee to plan and conduct every aspect of our local walk. And so those volunteers are connected then with the volunteers leading walks all over the country. We have a, um, a basically a Facebook for, for walk um, for those leaders that they can communicate with walk volunteers all over the country to learn about things that they're doing and then how we can do them in our local markets as well. Yeah, I know I get um, emails from the Alzheimer's support organization um, to help me build my support, my, my walk team. So once again, y'all, if you want to join my team or if you want to donate, you can do that through this link. And I will um, be posting this on Facebook because our walk here isn't until October, right? Right. Ours is Saturday, October 2nd at Four Field in downtown Greenville. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Kimberly, at, at Hey Boomer, um, our mission is to inspire and motivate people over 55 to live full, productive, useful lives for as long as possible. And I always ask um, my guests if there are one or two takeaways that they would like to leave the audience with um, based on what we talked about today. What would you like to talk about with the audience? Volunteer, advocate, donate. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there you go. No, but I, I really love that, that you encourage people to stay active and engaged throughout their life, you know, because I think that's really a, a key essential factor in maintaining brain health is keeping those healthy connections. I mean, that's one of the things we tell people to look for as a risk factor, is, or not a risk factor, but as a warning sign, is when people start to withdraw from, from social activities. So we encourage people, stay out there, stay active, stay engaged, keep growing new pathways in your brain to strengthen your brain health. And like you said, giving to a cause, there's, there's just nothing greater than knowing that you're giving to something bigger than yourself. You know, I said early in this conversation that I work every day for my future and that's true, but I work every day for your future too. I work every day so that, as I said before, one day we will all live in a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. You know, I want there to be a day that daddies don't forget their little girls. Mm -hmm. And I want there to be a day that, as you hold your grandmother's hands, as she passes for, from you, like mine did, that she knows who it is that is with her and holding her hand. Um, mm. I want that for other people. Um, I want that for my grandchildren. Yeah, that's a beautiful wish. And I, ho I hope that we can all get there. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Yeah, so um, just one more time, the Alzheimer's Association uh, website is alz.org. And from there, you can find any information about any of your states where you are and get connected locally and a ton of resources. So thank you, Kimberly. This has really been very helpful. I'm so glad, Wendy. It's been nice to talk to you. I've yeah. loved you, Mom, for a long time, and I'm really enjoying getting to know you better, too. Thank you. I'll see you at the walk. Yes, most, most definitely. <laughs> so I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Walk to End Alzheimer's and the Alzheimer's Association, the co-sponsors of the Boomers Thriving um, Summit that's coming up, and the, um, the Meals on Wheels. Greenville, and each one of those organizations is going to get 10% of your registration fee. So another big part of Hey Boomer is giving back. We are all about making a difference. So I'm looking forward to being able to give you hopefully a good check for that, Kimberly. 
Thank you. Um, before I tell you about our guests for next week, I want to let you all know that I'm taking July off. I am going to Yosemite National Park. I will spend some time with my grandkids. I will be doing some updating for the show and planning some new um, initiatives that I want to offer through Hey Boomer. But uh, you will see me. I mean, I will post little snippets of things. I will still be doing my blog. So you will see me. But we will be ending season two after next week. And then starting season three, the beginning of August. A couple of very nice comments here. Kimberly, great guest, great show. So, yeah, that's nice. Thank you. So our last guest for season two, his name is Dick Hayduck. And Dick had a career in the life sciences where he has been a principal and strategic advisor. He has rediscovered an early passion for writing. So when he was a little guy, he wanted to be a writer and then he moved on from that. But now that he is retired and in his 70s, he's exploring that again. And he just um, published a book that he calls Shifting Gears. 50 baby, baby boomers share their meaningful story into retirement. So we'll be talking about some of the struggles and joys of transitioning from work, whatever that has been, to the next chapter, which may also include another form of work. So that should be interesting. I always like to end my show with a quote from C.S. Lewis, where he says, you are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. Thank you all for joining us for this show. I know your time is valuable. I appreciate all of you. And let's just keep growing and dreaming together. My name is Wendy Green, and this has been Hey Boomer. Bye.